Now let's have a look at the uh, product line architecture of the Ship System 2000. Uh, we start with the requirements and the qualities. As you've seen, the primary purpose of the architecture is to achieve a system that meets its behavioural and quality requirements. The architecture of a Ship System 2000 product line member was no exception. The most important of these requirements were performance, as you might expect. Command and control systems must respond within real-time constraints. It's not much good if they don't. Modifiability. Um, now, there's a certain amount of it that had to be modifiable uh, so that it could meet the uh, requests and requirements of the different uh, clients. Safety, reliability and availability. Um, you, you know, if you have a defense system, you can do without it being uh, flaky. So it has to be safe to operate, does what it's supposed to do, it has to be reliable um, and available. You can't say, well, sorry, it's down. Testability. You have to be able to test this thing. So there was a strong need for testability, particularly as you're rolling a new product, you have to be able to test and prove the whole thing all over again. Besides the single system requirements, the Ship System 2000 architecture carried the additional burden of application to an entire class of systems. Thus, the requirements included the ability to replace one module with another tailored to a particular system without disrupting the rest of the architecture. So plug in, plug out is necessary. And for the physical architecture of the system, you can see there that what is essentially a message bus architecture that um, enabled all these different systems to communicate. And so developing that message bus um, and the protocol for the messages on the message bus would have been a, a fairly significant shift from previous attempts. The sensors and weapons are deployed all over the ship. The crew interact with sensors uh, and weapons via distributed workstations. Uh, so this, you know, you basically fly by wire or sail by wire. It had to be a fault tolerant design. So you can, if you look at the diagram there, you will see the, um, the uh, bus, there's a, a dual bus, so two of them. The redundant LAN is a communications backbone and the message bus architecture is uh, how they, one of the fundamental features of it all. Now for a process view, each CPU, and bear in mind there are about 70 CPUs, runs a set of ADA programs. Right? Each ADA program runs on at most one uh, processor. So we don't have multi-processor programs. Uh, we do have um, programs, there's multiple, multiple copies of programs running on different uh, processors multiple programs running on the one processor, but we don't have one program running across processors. The program may consist of several ADA tasks, and a Ship System 2000 product line can consist of up to 300 ADA programs. Right. Now the consequence of that distributed platform meant that it necessitates building a system as a set of communicating processes, bringing the process view into play. Now this, this could be interesting, it could be tricky because you've got significant coordination problems to uh, deal with. Now having a process view means that the performance tactic of introduced concurrency has been applied. So as I say, if, if you're going to have separate cooperating processes, you have to have the means of um, coordinating them and um, making sure they are concurrent or um, dealing with that. Distributed systems also raise issues of deadlock avoidance and communication protocol, fault tolerance, um, network management and saturation avoidance, um, performance concerns. These are some of the concerns that have to be thought about and designed into the system once you decide on, once it is, they decided on this whole idea of distributed cooperating um, processes. The number of conventions are used to support the distribution. These respond to the distributed requirements of the architecture as well as its product line aspects. The tasks and intercomponent conventions include, and we go on to the next slide, we're dealing with communication among processes. Right? Communication among components is by the passing of strongly typed messages. Abstract data type and manipulation programs are provided. Strong typing allows compile time elimination of a whole class of errors. Uh, the more I hear about uh, strong and weak typing, um, if you really are concerned about quality 
and reliability, you really ought to use a strongly typed language or impose strong typing on your system. The message as a primary interface mechanism between components allows components to be written independently of each other and allows those components to be changed without affecting the, the architecture. Now this, this is a lesson that uh, comes through not only from Celsius Tech and its experience but also comes from Microsoft where they've gotten down to um, basically designed by contract. Interfaces are well specified and they are fairly fixed. Um, and as long as you meet the, the your contracted obligations that you have through the interface, then you can implement as you wish. Interprocess communication is a protocol for data transport, allowing communication between applications regardless of their residence and particular processes. Now this anomaly of processor assignment allows processes to be migrated across processes for pre-runtime performance, tuning at runtime configuration is an approach to fault tolerance with no accompanying changes in the source code. So making them independent of any one particular processor means you can move them around and you can introduce another processor and, and uh, move load your balances that way. Ada task facilities are used to implement the threading model. All right, so that's a minor technical detail there. The layered view. Now not only are these things separated across processes, the architecture implements a layered view of things. The grouping of modules is roughly based on the type of information they encapsulate. Modules that must be modified if the hardware platform underlying LAN or internode communications are changed form one layer. Modules that implement functionality common to all members of the family form another layer. Modules specific to a particular customer product form a, a layer as well. Right. So this is your very um, uh, the very essence of a layered architecture really. You have things that, that are very close to the, um, the hardware. You have things that perform a whole lot of services that might draw on the various uh, pieces of hardware. And you have uh, implementation specific things that one customer requires and these all form separate layers. The Ship System 2000 layered architecture, uh, the base layer provides the interface between the op applications and the operating system hardware and network, as you can see there right at the bottom. And the base layer provides the interface with other applications without concern for the underlying platforms. So that's how it's done. So in summary then, Celsius Tech provides an example of a successful product line architecture development. The architecture and system have been extended beyond the original base of ships to airfields. Recent report are that Celsius Tech systems require about 3,000 parameters, which is not a trivial system.